In this chapter, we'll take a look at working with compression to help tighten up the overall volume of your track. In a nutshell, a compressor controls the dynamics of your audio by automatically adjusting the levels. With a traditional compressor, once your audio gets past a certain level, called a threshold, the compressor is then instructed to turn the volume down. How much the volume is reduced is based on the ratio setting. A ratio of 1 to 1 would result in no gain reduction. However, a ratio of 2 to 1 would mean that for every 2 dB that the level goes over the threshold, only allow 1 dB out. If that is still confusing, let's give a simple example. If you have set your threshold to the level of minus 12 dB, and your ratio is 2 to 1, then you would be applying a reduction of 6 dB. There are also other controls of a compressor, such as your attack and release times, which control how fast the compressor is to react to the changes in the level. In the last couple of years, there has been a growing trend in regards to compression and how much is being used on recent commercial releases. We refer to this as the loudness wars. The trend is calling for every CD to be as loud or louder than the next guy's. However, the unpleasant side effect is that this loss of natural dynamics of the audio itself. This trend has started to be debated from various mastering engineers and audiophiles and hopefully we'll see a reversal to this trend in the near future. Okay, with all that said, let's take a look at when and how you should apply compression. Now as with anything I might demonstrate in this video, there are no hard fast rules, just simple guidelines. In the end, it will be your ears that judge the final result. Just as with the EQ chapter, there is a must-have tool that should be in your device chain. This time, it's a decent RMS meter. The RMS value is your loudness. This is the level that you'll need to concentrate on. Some good ones I recommend are Inspector by Roger Nicholas Digital or Peak Meter Pro from Blue Cat Audio. Some RMS meters, by default, will have a slow response time to show you the average in loudness. This is good for when you're maximizing the final output, which we'll look at later on. However, when applying compression, I like to use a faster response so I can see the dynamics of the audio. Load up your compressor in your device chain right before your RMS meter. As with the EQ, the compressor plugin you will use will depend on the features and sound quality you are after. If possible, Try to use a compressor that offers the basic controls of a threshold, ratio, attack, and release. We'll have a closer look at the various compressors available in Chapter 8. Before making any adjustments to your compressor, take a look at the RMS levels of your audio. Watch for the lower RMS levels and the upper RMS levels. What is the difference? This is a good judge for your current dynamic range. Depending on the audio I'm working with, for most mainstream music such as pop or rock, I find that a dynamic range of 6 dB gives me the desired tightness without the overcompressed feeling. To get the desired dynamic range, I calculate the current dynamic range and subtract my desired range to get a number of how much the compressor needs to reduce the audio by. So if the audio has a dynamic range of 12 dB and I want it to be 6 dB, then I need to have the compressor reduce the level by 6 dB. Now that I know how much to reduce, I need to set up the compressor to do so. As I described earlier, the reduction amount is a result from a calculation between the threshold value and the ratio. So in theory, I could enter a threshold of minus 12 and a ratio of 2 to 1, and that would give me a 6 dB reduction. However, this would not always be the case. You need to set your threshold to a level that would actually make a difference. If set too high, then you would be reducing only the peaks, and not much of the dynamic range. If set too low, then you would be just reducing the overall volume, not necessarily reducing the dynamic range. So in my example here, I'm going to set the threshold to around the lower values of my RMS meter, and set the ratio so that it works out to be a 6 dB reduction. At this time, I'd like to point out that you will need to apply your math skills here to work out the ratio based on your threshold and desired reduction amount. For many, myself included, do not want to bother with the calculation process. In that case, I would recommend a compressor plugin that shows you the resulting curve. 
This allows you to adjust the ratio until the graph shows the desired amount of reduction. Several compressors will come with a gain reduction meter in addition to an output meter. This allows you to quickly see how much reduction is actually being achieved. If you are trying to reduce the audio by 6 dB, then watch the gain reduction as you adjust the ratio until you see a 6 dB reduction. If you are doing this, be sure to pass through various sections of your audio source to ensure that you are not reducing the quieter passages by 6 dB. This would result in a much larger reduction to the louder passages. Slower gain reduction meters may be more suited for this job. Another thing to consider when choosing your compressor. Once you have your desired reduction and dynamic range, you may want to adjust the attack and release settings to smooth out the effects of the compressor. The attack setting will control how fast the compressor begins to reduce the audio once passing the threshold. If this setting is set too slow, the compressor won't have any real effect. Setting it too fast will lead to distortion. As a general rule, I use a setting that will allow just the transients of the audio source to pass through the compressor unaffected. Again, this will depend on the audio you are working with. The release setting controls how fast the compressor will return to normal level after the audio has fallen below the threshold. I often use a slower release time so that the audio isn't falling back so fast that it creates a pumping sound. It is easy enough just to start with a release time of about 50 milliseconds and slowly increasing the release time till you hear no more pumping from the compressor. A tip here is if your compressor has a gain reduction meter, is to watch this meter while adjusting the release. Here you can see just how fast the compressor is being released. Here I'm going to show you how I often will set my attack and release times. Again, I stress that this is not a golden rule and that all master engineers out there will do the same. However, I do find this a great starting point and an excellent way to learn about the relationship between the attack and release settings. For this, you'll need a compressor that has a gain reduction meter. Before I have made any adjustments to my ratio setting, I'll be sure that my attack and release settings are as low as they can go. I then adjust my ratio till I have the desired gain reduction. Next, I will increase my release time so the compressor smooths out the audio level a bit. The reduction amount actually increases. This is because the audio is not being released back to its original level fast enough before the compressor applies even more reduction. This gives you a great demonstration of the relationship between the release setting to the compressor. Now, I don't want that extra gain reduction that was introduced by the increased release time. To counteract this, I will adjust my attack time. Increasing the attack time will lower the reduction amount. I will set my attack time so the reduction is the same as before I altered the release time. This is a result of the compressor being slower to respond. Therefore, the release has a better chance to returning the audio to the original level before more reduction is applied. On a side note, as you can imagine, there are many software compressors out there. Some might have no attack or release settings at all. These compressors will analyze the audio and determine automatically the best attack and release times. These are great if you do not want to mess around with tweaking. However, I should warn that some of these plugins may do a better job than others. Something you should check if you plan on buying such a compressor. Some compressors offer a makeup gain. As you are essentially reducing the loudness, the makeup gain will allow you to compensate for this reduction. Good for if you're applying a large amount of reduction. Otherwise, you will most likely not need to make any adjustments to a makeup gain. A lot of plug-in compressors offer multiband compression, which has a great advantage when it comes to gaining more control over your compression. How this works is that your compressor will split the audio into two or more frequency bands and allow you to compress each band individually. This is an excellent benefit as often you'll find that the audio source may have the desired dynamics in one frequency while needing some reduction in another, which can help avoid any unnecessary compression. When working with multiband compressors, I approach each band in the same fashion as I did earlier with a single band compressor. I should point out though that there is a risk of altering the overall frequency curve that you have created with your EQ. This is due to the fact that you might end up reducing one frequency band by a large amount. But the advantage here is that there is much less of a chance that you'll hear the compressor working, which is often described as a pumping sound. 
Often, I'll find my frequency curve to be spot on and will use only a one band compressor over the entire range. So now that you have the dynamic range under control, your next step would be to maximize the loudness of your song, which we'll take a look at in the next chapter.